Hi, I'm Adam, and welcome once again to South Wales Ghost Watch. This is becoming a very regular thing now, isn't it? <laughs> okay, and on tonight's show, we're going to be talking about werewolves. Okay, now, uh, Martin, uh, yeah. once again, I, I have on the show with me today. Uh, Martin, but where do werewolves come from? Um, what we need to do is draw a number of psychological and, um, I suppose, uh, sociological links here. Um, humans exist in a world where we convinced ourselves that we are not animals. We are somehow um, beings who have escaped nature. The very fact that if we acute, well, we often say that person is a real animal. You know, he's an animal. He acted like an animal. Um, but it, the interesting point is that it's not the animals who've organised war, it's not the animals who've developed concentration camps. So one of the interesting patterns about a creature that is that changes from human to animal is particularly disturbing. Um, in um, ancient Egyptian mythology, the gods had animal heads and human bodies. Um, the idea there was that the animal had a certain quality that was useful, that humans could learn from by putting animal heads on human bodies. Uh, Anpu, which is the uh, god Anubis, was he who sits upon the mound. And the idea was that when the Nile flooded, the animal, the, the jackal, survived on the mound so that it was teaching humans um, how to survive. To the Egyptian mind, that's fine. But let's jump forward a little bit further. According to the Christian mythology called creation, God made humans in his image. And the animals were created as um, sub to humans, inferior to humans. Um, so a very fact that a human being to the Christian mythology it changes from animal, from human to animal, is thereby completely outside the experience and expectations of that. So, a werewolf summons up all sorts of ideas. Um, the wolf, the hare, and I suppose the bear or whatever, were traditionally um, creatures that were seen outside of not connected with the church. The wolf is given a very bad press. Um, the wolf is supposed to travel in packs and rip humans to get pieces. Its wild nature means it attacks everything around it. So a human being who changes from a human to a, wor a wolf suddenly loses all their finesse and all their protection and all their kindness and turns into a roughening beast and rips people to pieces. Um, <clears throat> the problem then becomes, you know, if you can't say who is what or what they are, they are also, unlike the vampires, they're very much creatures of this world, yeah? Mm. And going back to New Moon from last week, remember it's the werewolves who suddenly become, no, they're werewolves, in adolescence. Now that's an interesting metaphor for sexuality and hormones and all sorts of things yeah. shooting everywhere. So a werewolf is a creature that is very threatening. It rips people to pieces. Um, and it's something that is not natural. The vampire was undead. 
Yeah? Mm. Yeah? So it is cursed because it should be dead. But a werewolf is something that transforms. It is something that is alive, yeah, but is unnatural. Mm. But it's not dead. But it's not dead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah? And um, the, the, the idea that humans can change into animals is disturbing to humans. Um, the creature, there is, there is a werewolf and there is an animagus and an animagus is a creature that can at will turn into a wolf. It's mentioned in Harry Potter. Yes, um, yeah. And um, <clears throat> the, the werewolf is a creature, I suppose, who would have lots of advantages. Um, it could survive as an animal, it could survive as a human. Uh, and if you think back to the examples of the uh, ancient Egyptians, uh, it may well be influenced very much by um, ideas of, of, of the gods having animal heads. Now to the church, right, the idea that, uh, that we can, humans change from animals to uh, humans to animals it, is really frightening because it means that there is no clear difference between a human and an animal. Now that, to me, that's why I'm a vegetarian, because we're effectively just animals as well. Mm. Um, and that's why we need to... But, but that, that's, that's, that's another thing. Um, wolves are with us every day. They are the domesticated dog. Yeah. The wolf, yeah, if you like, chose to be domesticated. And a person can become cursed into becoming a, a, a werewolf. That's right. If, if they're bitten by it's a It's a metaphor yeah. for somebody who's on the edge. Okay. Right. Yeah. Dogs and humans both grew up together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that may have also a lot to do with the werewolf legend as well. There is an argument that the urban fox at the moment is very close to domestication. Because more foxes now live in urban areas than live in country areas. And I noticed stories up here about the threat from the urban fox. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and that's something, if you like, eating into that legend. Yeah? Yeah. That sort of thing. So the werewolf is a very powerful creature. In terms of um, tribal societies, um, witch doctors, uh, the shamans, are supposed to be able to turn themselves into creatures and observe how nature is working. So the werewolf legend comes from all sorts of backgrounds. I see, okay. Um, right, I'm going what can you tell me about uh, werewolf traits and weaknesses then? Well, <clears throat> first of all, according to the tradition, werewolves turn into werewolves at the full moon. Yes. Now, that's supposed to be, if you think about that in a, in a sort of a way, that is when the full moon is at its most powerful. What we know is that when we have a full moon is that uh, growth accelerates. We know that tides are higher. We know the moon is the orb that rules the night. The moon is the opposite of the sun. Uh, it suggests that the emotionality, water, is drawn out at that time and we become more emotional. So the werewolf is thereby shown as a creature that is under the influence of the moon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, wolves do not tend to be around during the day, so there's a direct parallel there with that. Just like the vampire. Yeah. But the moon is also associated with the old pagan pre-Christian legends as well. Um, so that um, anything that dances in the moonlight is not to do with the church, is not to do with the world of um, uh, that the good Christian lives in. So the werewolf is beyond the church because of its animal nature. There are implications of sexuality there as well. Um, in the in the New Moon trilogy, there are lots of implications that werewolves are very sort of sexual, powerful beings as yes. well. Yeah. 
The werewolf as well is traditionally afraid, well it's traditionally shot with a silver bullet. Mm. Yeah, it, it kills it, doesn't it? It destroys it. It kills yeah. it uh, because silver is linked with the moon. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and silver is also, um, if you like, a precious metal. Um, and the weakness of the werewolf is because it is killed by the silvery, the silver bullet, which is which is once more linked back to the moon because of similarities between the colours. The col yes. Um, and it is also the idea that only a silver bullet can do that. Yeah. yeah. The old fairy legends, which we'll talk about in another episode, mm -hmm. talk about fairies being frightened of of of, of iron. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you cannot kill a, vam uh, a werewolf with iron. It has to be silver. Yeah. Because the werewolf is a creature that exists outside. It is a tradition. It's an animal that can move from. It's creature move from human to animal. It has more to do with ancient mythologies. The werewolf is not put off by the cross. Okay, right. Because if it's human, that turns to animal. Christian ideas. The animal has not fallen, it's not sinful, it is a lesser being. So it's not affected in that way. Okay. So there's some of the strengths and weaknesses. The, the, the werewolf has tremendous physical strength um, and can adapt. Um, wolves stay faithful to their partners, they do not bark, they very rarely attack human beings. Um, and as I said, they are that sort of um, creature that disturbs us because it cannot be predicted. Okay, okay. Uh, so how long have werewolves been in existence for? Well, <clears throat> you can trace the werewolf legend about animals that can, humans that can change from um, humans to animals right back to the beginning of time. Okay. The, the shaman and the witch doctors um, are able to transform themselves because they understand nature. The, um, the, the um, Indian tribe, notice it's the Indian tribes who are in the, in the Stephanie Myers books, that um, know about this tradition. It's not seen as something unnatural, it's seen as an ability that tribal people have. Tribal people often call themselves the crocodiles, the bears, the wolves. Yes. They use that idea because they are looking after the positive qualities of the animal. Okay. So the werewolf legend is powerful because it stretches right back into our traditional past. Into the idea of humans as part of nature. We are an animal. Yes. We believe that we have triumphed over that. And that's why it is really scary. Um, because of that, um, I'm thinking of the uh, Howling films as well. I and, haven't seen them. And the Howling books, okay. where um, groups of people are secretly werewolves. Okay. And are able to exist outside society. It's the ultimate fear thing that there are these. But it is the fear of the animal within us by denying it, that probably originates in these legends. They're actually looking for the science of animals, the value of what animals tell us. We look, we think of animals as savage, as vicious, as the beast that comes out of nowhere and kills us, rips us to pieces. Yeah. But the werewolf um, is a creature that deserves respect in the legends and a creature of wisdom. Um, there have been there are some famous books. There's a there's a book written by Herman Hesse called Steppenwolf, which is about a, a man in his midlife who talks about the wolf within um, and learns to respect it. And by do, using that, he becomes psychologically mature. Okay. By denying the irrational, 
we lose so much. And that's what the werewolf is about, really. Well, it's talking metaphorically as well. Uh, it's talking metaphorically as well. Yeah. Yeah. There are probably lots of cases with Eddie Todon, who I mentioned last week, who talks about the, um, uh, the, the hauntings by werewolves. Mm. There are cases where people take um, hallucinogenic substances and see themselves turning into a werewolf. <laughs> there are cases where people have... Um, um, where, where, where people actually are very hairy. And I, I remember a film called Company of Wolves from the 80s, which is about um, werewolves. That's a very strongly sexual film. And they say you can look for a werewolf by if his eyebrows meet in the middle. <laughs> okay. Uh, so how can someone be cursed into becoming a werewolf? Well... Their whole idea was that if you were bitten by a werewolf, you know, your blood was transformed by that dominant. In the film, in the series of Supernatural, they call these characters alphas. And they have the idea that you are cursed into by a werewolf by being bitten. You know? Now, it may simply be that in terms of shamanic ideas and witch doc ideas of witch doctors that rather than a curse it may actually be an opportunity to perceive that we are just another animal animal here on this world mm. and that it is not a curse okay but nevertheless it's perceived as a curse yes yeah 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 uh, and you know that is the problem we are frightened of the unknown, we are frightened of the animal within. Is it a curse or is it an opportunity to understand that side of ourselves? Okay. Um, have there been many werewolves sighted, generally? Uh, in um, Lee Richards is the person to ask a lot about that. He says that there actually have been real werewolf sightings in Wales. I haven't yet come across any werewolves, yeah. but I... Re I uh, I think there are some very strange hauntings. You did mention the Welsh werewolf and I'm Yes, that's right. Yeah. There are very strange hauntings where um, creatures are seen that appear to be part animal and part uh, human or whatever. I, I think um, I've never come across any examples myself, <laughs> but I've come across plenty of people who fear that they could be. Um, it's a frightening thought. It's a frightening that? thought and it's something that's really alarming. Um, as I said, um, the idea of sometimes being frightened of the beast within allows, allows us to project the thought outwards and see the beast without. Yes. Um, and the old idea that spirits and certain uh, who could frighten humans um, can appear in forms that frighten them the most. I believe in uh, uh, Harry Potter there's a creature called the Bogle that you keep in a cupboard and whatever you fear most it will appear as. Um, and uh, the idea that there is part psychological, part cultural and possibly some poor devils in the, who were terribly misformed and very hairy. Hmm. Okay, so how do you think the werewolf myth has influenced stuff on the TV? Uh, films like Curse of the Werewolf, uh, the old Hammer Horror film with uh, Oliver Reed, to Silver Bullet, a uh, 1980s uh, film, um, which has attracted you know, a lot of attention, and American Werewolf in London as well, uh, which yeah. is another old... There's an interesting one as well, uh, Being Human, uh, a TV yes, series, right. which, which I've watched I recently. Mean, I think that the, the recent of Being Human is very interesting. <laughs> what is it, a werewolf, a vampire and a ghost? And, uh, a, and ghost. a ghost, yeah. It's very bizarre, isn't it? Share the yeah. same house. Mm. And... I think that that's, an in, that's the most interesting development recently. It's the idea that we each have different ideas and different ways of living and we're all part existing. Yes. Um, it's the most sympathetic view ever of werewolves. Um, and rather than exclude, we're moving towards an inclusion of, that, of, that, of the werewolf motif. Mm -hmm. um, the werewolf, it was actually before, it was the fear of the animal that ripped us apart, the savage animal. But there's no record of that ever really happening. Um, obviously, uh, wolves, when they're starving, will attack. 
Mm. Human beings will eat one another when they're starving, if necessary. Mm. Um, but the werewolf throughout the legend is always shown as a, as, a, as a raging, vicious creature. It's shown as not being rational, not being clever. It's effectively an animal. Mm. Whereas, looking at Stephanie Myers' work, it is the werewolf who has the most truly human experience of love and support. And I would suspect that we are becoming more tolerant and more understanding. And so these creatures that are different reveal that we live in a society with many different people, with many different attitudes, many different ways of looking at things. And so rather than the, the beast within, the ravening beast, we become more tolerant. And I think that's how it's... Yes, and we're all, we're all evolving, we're all becoming more intelligent, aren't we? And yeah, that's right. And that's right. Yes. Okay, is there a connection between uh, werewolves and vampires then? You mentioned this something last week, or we touched on it last week, didn't we? Yeah. Um, they're both seen as a very different sort of people. The vampire is not dead, not alive. The werewolf is human and animal, and is very much alive, and exists in very different sorts of worlds. The the vampire senses emotion. The werewolf notices emotion by smell, by raw animal ruggedness. And so they're very different types of people, according to the legends. We're going back much more to Stephanie Mayers, there's the idea of the uh, a truce between the vampires and the werewolves, that there was a constantly a battle between them, and that they keep off each other's land. Um, both vampires and werewolves also have a kind of a sexuality, but there is a more animal perceived sexuality about werewolves, whereas a more calculating idea from the vampire. Yes, and because they look more human as well. They look more human, and the idea is, but they're more human and are not, and werewolves are human, and change into something that is not. Um, and it, what's the comforting about the, the, the werewolves in Stephanie Myers' work is in the films. They look like gigantic doggies who are really kind and look after us, but are terribly savage to evil bastards who are vampires <laughs> from the other side. So our fear of the werewolf may also originate from our fear of not knowing, of being different, of a human who is also an animal. But also that fear of dogs, yeah? Yeah. Every now and then, a particular breed of dog is seen as a major threat, like the, uh, what do you call it, the, the bull terrier, the, the, the mastiff, the bull terrier, the rottweiler, yeah? Mm. In Victorian England, those dogs were known as nanny dogs because they were traditionally used to protect children and because they were kind and protective. But they have been shown to be wild and vicious and, for, and, fe and, f and feed into this werewolf myth as well. Mm. I suppose that's how they're perceived. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. different people perceive them differently, don't they? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So there's a sort of an influence there. Okay, well, uh, well, thanks very much for coming on the show again, uh, Martin. It's been a pleasure talking to you, as, as always. And uh, that's all we've got time for uh, this evening, guys. Uh, tune in next week, where we're going to be discussing uh, trolls and fairies. That should be an interesting one. Uh, well, thank you uh, all, and uh, have a good night.